like now to invite our first uh, speaker of tonight, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Khalidi, to present his speech and presentation for us. Dr. Khalidi. Her Excellency, Ambassador, Mr. Fadul Rahman, and your colleagues who uh, helped putting together this great event, yes. and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me talking to you on the occasion of celebrating a centenary of Afghan independence from the British colonial hegemony. I shall discuss to you, or I shall talk to you about what are we celebrating today, why is it important, its historical context. Uh, we are celebrating because it is important in our history, because it shaped our history, and its consequences still shaping our history, and it's still relevant on today's circumstances around Afghanistan, on the politics that shapes Afghanistan, it's still relevant. First, I would like to talk to you about a little bit of, about Afghanistan. As you can see, Afghanistan is located in southern edges of Central Asia. This is an important area in Asia. It's, it's the hub. Many trade routes went through Afghanistan, from China, the Silk Road, to the Middle East, from India to the Middle East, and vice versa. And also this area was a crossroad of the invaders, of various cultures, people came to this area, melted here. You see this triangle? Afghanistan is located in a triangle of civilization, ancient civilization, 6,000 years old. We, Afghanistan is located on the southern and eastern, the Indus Valley civilization, the two major cities of Harpa and Mohenjo-daro, and in the north, which is the Bactria Margiana uh, complex. These, this is, so this civilization is 6,000 years old, at least. And this is an ancient time map. This is the Greek produced by the uh, Greeks who came with Alexander the Great and then they created this uh, uh, famous period in history, but, uh, the greco bactrian Empire. In this map, we could see Oriana uh, located at the southern part of the axis, the Amud area, and we could see Parthia, we could easily see India, and Arabcusia, and Sophia to the north. This area, next one, please. now, that name is not invented by the Greeks. They took the name Arya from the Vedic literature, from Avestan literature. So we have a history of, which lasted 2,500 years. Uh, this is the two, from 500 to 2000 before the Christ. That people of this area had a civilization, and people, they created so many cities, and people migrated around that area, from this part, from Hindu Kush, the, uh, the city, Aryan of Egypt, was located in Hindu Kush. And they migrated south and east to India and to, to Persia, to Iran, and other places. 
Yeah. Now, we had, during a long period, we had the, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, the Greco uh, Bactrian uh, Empire, then we had the uh, uh, Koshan Empire, the great uh, Hephthalites, uh, uh, and the, the, uh, the followed by the Sassanids period. And for, we arrived at the Islamic era with great dynasties that, are, you know, from our area arose and they created uh, uh, dynasties that uh, went from east to west, from India to, to India to Iran to Central Asia, and even up to Turkey. The Seljukis, the Huris, the uh, Ghaznavis, they all uh, famous names in history, which impacted many civilizations, many uh, parts of the world, including Europe. We are on at 1708. This is the time that the three gunpowder uh, empires were in play. The Turkish Ottoman Empire, the Safavid Empire of Persia, and the Mughal Empire in India. At this time, in 1709, Hotikis from Afghanistan, they, this is the first indigenous density who, dynasty who rose and they uh, created, a uh, carved a country for themselves. They defeated the Persians, the, the Safavids. They also took over the remnants of the Mughal Empire in Kabul up to the, the current day Pakistan. However, their reign was like 28 years long. So, uh, succeeded by the Afsharis of Persia. But soon after, next one, the, the Durrani Empire came to existence, which is the state from 14, uh, 1747 that exists till today as a continuous country. This is why we take our contemporary history from this date. This country, uh, which was created at the time, not necessarily name was Afghanistan, but Afghanistan name came into uh, known by virtue of the demographics of people who lived there by the virtue of the nature of the government which was in power. By 1779, this name was officially, in, in many uh, official documents uh, of, on, on, in the countries of the area. And this, uh, that empire once extended from the Caspian Sea to close to Lahore and, and Delhi, and from the Oxus to the Arabian Sea. Next. Now, this country, unfortunately, we, uh, Afghanistan, came into confrontation with a colonial empire who took foothold in India, and that great Durrani Empire was reduced to current borders of Afghanistan. Now, this is why we are celebrating today the centenary of our independence, because we put to an end that 123 years of interference in the affairs of Afghanistan. So, 100 years ago, Amman al-Akhan 
ratified a treaty which ended the Third Anglo-Afghan War. The treaty was discussed in Raoul Pinti after the ceasefire of the Third Anglo-Afghan War. Now, some people may question whether Afghanistan was ever a colony or not. And it's, it's dictionary meaning. Even some important people question that, like Jawaharlal Nehru. He wrote that he didn't know why Afghanistan uh, you know, went to war with British India, the third Anglo Afghan war. And even the British themselves downplayed the war. They downplayed the war, even if it was not included in the Treaty of Raul Pendi. After protestation by the Afghan head of the delegation, Ali Ahmed Khan, the head of the British delegation, Sir Hamilton Grant, which was the foreign secretary of the British India, he took a pen and took a piece of paper and wrote that with this treaty, we accept Afghanistan as an independent in its internal and external affairs. Second, with this treaty, all previous treaties between Afghanistan and British India were null and void. Third, from that day, the British would stop paying their subsidies to Afghanistan. So, this is why oh, th th that treaty was signed on 8th of August 1990. By the time it was communicated to Kabul and, and I mean, Amon Lahan ratified it, it was 19th of August of the same year, or 28th of Asset 1920. No, no. Now, okay, we see Afghanistan reduced from those territories, next one please, to this map. Can, can we go back to the first one? You see the British India in Bangal, this is 1781, British was in Bangal. Next one, please. But in 1895, British got to the port of Afghanistan. So 123 years, what happened? Next one, please. What this happened? Britain, when they were in Bangal, they were trying to extend the colonization of India. They had no adversity, powerful enough to stop their colonial expansion. Afghanistan, Zaman Shah, was the only superpower of the area at the time. Maharaj of, of India and people of India asked him to assist Indians by expelling the British. They were able to pay 2,000 uh, two lakh rupees per day, the cost of the war of his British, of his army, of Afghan army, to fight the British. So British could not fight at the time. So what they did, they went by subversive. They went around. They went to show off Persia. They persuaded the Shah of Persia to attack from the west. And they went also to the local adversaries in uh, 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 northwest uh, India to oppose the, uh, the Afghan uh, state. So by the time the Manchur armies were in Lahore, the Persians invaded from the west. We had to go back. That is caused and the British advised the Persians to help his brother, Shah Mahmud, and bring him to throne in Afghanistan as a puppet. For the next 40 or 60 years, this aristocracy 
the brothers and the uncles, they all fought each other. And it all started with the British asking the Persians to assist Shah Mahmud. And he succeeded removing Zaman Shah from Troll, blinding him, and so Afghanistan misery started from there. So Afghan with British uh, uh, exchanges started indirectly, which was disastrous for Afghanistan. Now, the policy of the British at the time was to create chaos in Afghanistan to reduce the power of the central authority. By, by 1838, there were three local power in Afghanistan. In Kabul, Dost Muhammad Khan, in Kandahar, his brother Kundal Khan, in Herat, Shahzada, Kambra. So there was no central authority. So this was time right for the British to to go ahead of direct colonization. So they embarked the first Anglo-Afghan war. So they thought, is Afghanistan right for colonization? And they thought, whoever has control of the peaks of Afghanistan, that power controls India. This was historically true. So they sent armies from three fronts to Afghanistan. They succeeded in installing his, uh, uh, their puppet in Kabul. And the Afghan state collapsed. However, it was very short lived. People of Afghanistan unite at the greatest time, the, the most despair the time, they united and they created a condition for the British. They killed their emissaries. They created a condition that the British could, could no longer continue their occupation in that one. Finally, they agreed to retreat. And on the retreat, they were decimated. This is Dr. Price. He is the only survivor from the whole British army who reached Jalalabad. This is 1839. To tell the British that the British army is gone. So, after the Anglo-Afghan, first Anglo-Afghan war, in Dost Muhammad Khan again came onto the throne and he succeeded over up to 1863 to reunite the country. He removed uh, the Kandahar, the Herat and North were all united back under the authority of the central government. He, once he succeeded, he passed away in Herat and he was buried. His son, Sheikh Ali Khan, became uh, the king. Now, for the next 38 years, the British were just looking for opportunities to come back. At the time, they had this food policy of a colonial food policy, and they wanted to install a, an envoy, an ambassador in Kabul, who should be a British or European descent, from European descent. They wanted to install that. They were afraid of the Tsarist Russia advances in Central Asia toward Afghanistan. So they sent Neville Chamberlain, 
who later became Prime Minister of the Great Britain, as envoy of Viceroy to take uh, his office in Kabul. He was refused by that von Burga officer. That uh, because of that refusal, the British uh, sent complete armies to install him or install an envoy by force. This happened in 1878 and 79. Okay. The, the, the second Anglo-Afghan war started. Again, the British uh, got to Kabul. They surrounded Kabul. Uh, Ashir Ali Khan left uh, Kabul, even to uh, north, to uh, request assistance from Tsarist Russia, which was not forthcoming. And he died over there. His son, Yaqub Khan, became a mean, and the British forced upon him a treaty, which is famous as Treaty of Gandoma. Remember, Gandumak was the place that the British army was decimated 38 years ago. Now, they camped in Gandumak and forced a treaty upon him, which required Afghanistan to accept an ambassador, which should be an European descent. Afghanistan should conduct its foreign relations through this envoy. And Afghanistan would receive uh, subsidies in return from the British. However, this arrangement did not last long. Kunari, who was the envoy, was killed in Kabul. Afghan people again rose up, and they, the British, had no uh, chance but to uh, return and retreat to India. So they agreed instead of being a chaos in the northwest frontier, the uh, northwest frontier of British India, they agreed for uh, uh, Abdurrahman Khan to take over. He, wa he wa was the nephew of Shirin Khan. Now, this is unfortunately one of our unfortunate times. Afghan people won the war, but they lost in diplomacy. Instead of enforcing our will on the British, Abdurrahman Khan asked the British what they want, to leave us alone. And this show, and the British took the opportunity by drafting by, by two hands. They said, well, if you don't like our Ambassador, okay, forget about the ambassador. But you conduct your foreign relations to us. And you make a trade with India, okay? And we will pay you subsidies in return. Abdurrahman Khan accepted this arrangement. They said, leave us alone so that we could build our nation, build our state, because the state was wrong. So for him to have time to opportunity to build a nation, build a nation government, build a, a state, he accepted. And British agreed that they would never foot inside of one son again. This is why Afghanistan from that day became a protectorate of the British Empire. We lost our foreign relations initiative. It was the British who was conducting the foreign relations. It was the British who started negotiating uh, our borders. Who, with Tsarist Russia, they uh, demarcated the border. And with Persia, they demarcated the borders. And with India, they wanted a scientific, as they call it, a scientific border. This, by scientific, they mean that India could be defendable aboard. So, Sir Henry Durand 
drew along through the mountains. So that was the, the, the time of the great day, which between Afghanistan, between the Russia, the Russia, Zaris Russia and the British, both claimed that to be Afghan friends. Were caught and Afghan, Afghanistan became, became a, a buffer zone between the Zaris Russia and the British India. Now, with, with regard to the British India, the Britain wanted another buffer zone between Afghanistan and British India. There was a law of British India passed in 1858. That law defined the British India border. There was a gap between those borders and Afghanistan. And those gap, those gap was the tribal mixed Was mixed one piece. Yeah. Next one, please. Yeah. This is the gap you could see is the Fata, the federally uh, uh, tribal area. Federally administered tribal area. The green is part of Pakistan. This area is, was not part of the British India. By Act of India, 1858. When British gave independence to India and Pakistan emerged, Pakistan and India became inheritance or the of the areas under the British India. This is why Pakistan was not in, did not inherit this area. This gap exists officially in law. When Sir Murtmi Duran, who was the Foreign Secretary of the British India, was asked after he signed the Treaty of uh, uh, during the line, uh, during line, that to, to explain this line, he mentioned, do not make mistakes, this is not a border. This is a line defining the areas of influence by the Amir and the areas of influence by the British administrators on a tribal people who are free. These are not my words, these are words of, of, of Sir Henry Durand. Uh, it's public. It was uh, for some reason not available before, but it's now publicly available. It is uh, Almanac uh, 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 reflected this. It's in the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia of, of uh, uh, that uh, produced by uh, Nancy Dupre and others. So he said. He defined it that this line defines the area of all influence on people. And do they are not subject of the British right. Unless they want it themselves. Or we accept that influence. And for up to now, these areas called of federally administered tribal areas. They are not part of Pakistan administration as such because it was not. Britain could not give them this area. This was not there. So this was a limbo. And that reduced Afghanistan from all areas. So what happened? We have 43 million Pashtuns in Pakistan. And we have about 20 million in advance, and between 15 to 20 million in advance. This line, why is important? Because you could see the, the figures, these are from Pakistan censor. Next one, please. Next one, please. Okay. Now, that Duran line, the issues of that time, is still alive. It's, it's still alive, it's still haunting us. And this is why even the, the United States has taken over the British rule of the hundred years of hundred and 
so, so, so many years. And because these areas be, became lawless, they became uh, they radicalized by the uh, various uh, stakeholders. Now, Declaration of Independence freed Afghanistan to embark a new era to modernize, to engage with the world. Next one. And also, it uh, introduced a lot of uh, innovative programs, including emancipation of women, new constitution giving rights to equal rights to people of Afghanistan, education for all, for women and, 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 and men, and building building a new city, a uh, new administrative uh, area of Kabul, uh, and that is the key part big, is the residence of him, next one, please. And he is uh, embarked a tour of Europe, next one, please. This is in Germany, 1928, next one, please. Yeah. So, this program of modernization, uh, there was resistance inside Afghanistan. And first it started in Paktia by Mulai Lang, and then followed by Shingwar people, and then by uh, Habibullah Kalakwani, which is famous as Bachi Saka. And all of these three uprisings None of them were political. None of them were ethnic. They were cultural. They were opposing elements of a culture which they thought was alien to the native culture of the time. There were problems. with the implementation of the programs and definition of the programs. People got confused between modernization and westernization. People got confused between uh, uh, westernization and development. So um, there were elements of the programs of the modernization which meant the, 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 the dress code which people didn't like. So Amunullah Khan was forced into exile, and he was uh, replaced by Habibullah Kalakani. Next one. He was from Shamali, and he was assisted to the throne by the clergy, by families, famous families of clergy, including the Naqshbandiya sect of all areas, the Mujahideen families, and others. Uh, he, he, he was uh, actually uh, declared crown by the peer of uh, Gulbaha, who was the, per the person who declared crown uncle of Amanullah Khan in Jalalabad. So you see, there are a lot of connections. So a lot of people were thinking that, you know, or still think that uh, uh, this, uh, these uprisings were the uh, plot of uh, British colonial uh, in India, that there are a lot of uh, elements of truth in this statement. However, we should not forget that Afghanistan culture, the traditions, how we relate to the world, and how we see modernization, and how there was an establishment, a structure establishment of reactionaries existed at the time. However, his rule was a short lived, nine months, and he was replaced by uh, Northern Khan. Now, people, some people might think that why, if popular support he had, why uh, it was short lived, nine months? The reason is 
First, the Pashtun tribes rose against Amman Khan because of cultural issues. But once they realized that the traditional, historical power of the aristocracy was lost from the Pashtun hands, they couldn't sit as a, 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 a idol anymore. So the first person who emerged, a famous Pashtun in Northern Khan, who was the ex defense minister at Barik Zahi, he was all Pashtun tribes of the tribal belt rallied around him. Another element is the Mujadidi family and other clergy who realized that under Bachi Saqaw, they could not sustain you know, their support on their interests in Afghanistan. They had a lot of connection with the aristocracy, the, the clergy. So they would lose all of their privileges over, over in, in a uh, long term. So they supported Nader Khan. Uh, Nur al mashayikh went to Pakhtia and met Nader Khan and met Shawali Khan. This is uh, evidence in Shawali Khan's book, Yo'a Khatrat Iman, So what happened? All the programs of Amir Amman Khan were stopped. Uh, we, uh, schools were uh, closed. Uh, development programs were stopped, and uh, uh, the rule of uh, uh, Sharia rule became the law of the nation. Constitution was stopped, and we and uh, taxation reforms were stopped. So we went back to the uh, back, backward and. The path to the future was very bleak indeed. It would take 30 year audience or more for Nader Khan and his son Zahir Shah to re-establish those programs which was initiated by Nader Khan. So it took us a once or 30 years back. So, next one. From the independent day till today, we see a continuation of a struggle between good and bad and the ugly in Afghanistan. A continuation of this, the, 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 the same thing. Those who opposed Amman Khan, they re in, in, uh, revitalized, they were revitalized, reinvigorated during the 1980s, thanks to the Western uh, nations uh, ahead uh, to our seven uh, pandemic in Pakistan and also in Iran. These were the elements who opposed Nader Khan. Uh, they reinvigorated. And, they, and once they got into power, they couldn't even form a government, a chaos, an anarchy which reduced the country. Again, we have central authority was lost. Central authority, this struggle between a central authority, state, and chaos, and, and uh, Molokuta, if you call it, or local war warlords ruling in the areas, was a continuous struggle till today. Now, after 2001, after American involvement in Afghanistan, we see the same, uh, you know, scenario is repeating itself. Those Taliban, uh, six years or five years rule, uh, established a medieval uh, type of government in Afghanistan. No constitution, Mullah was judged, Seven institutions anywhere. No element of modernization was allowed. Actually, modernization for clergy is a defeat. 
they never accept modernization. Any facet of modernization is a defeat for the clergy. So that was then and it is now. Now we are at the crossroads again. The time is frozen in Afghanistan. We came all circle again. Americans removed Taliban, now Americans are bringing them back. There's no principle in prison, in world politics. There's no principle. Democracy, rule of law, women's uh, rights, these are all, you know, fake for powerful countries like the United States. It doesn't matter. As long as you, you play with their rules, you just adhere to their interests, you're right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are back to square one. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khalidi.